Sorry, sorry. <laughs> oh, uh, you know, uh, sometimes when you sleep, uh, you can leave stuff and it's not touched. Uh, you know, other times though, they'd, uh, they'd strip the enamel from your goddamn teeth. <laughs> oh, sorry about the language. I, uh, I got it from your mother. Uh, you know, she, she had an awful tongue. My God, she knew how to use it. Uh, oh, well. Uh, let me tell you about my brother Pierce. Uh, you know, my brother Pierce. Uh, he was named after Paul Drake, the freedom fighter. Uh, you know, uh, my brother Pierce, the faggot. Because, uh, you know, well, that's what they shouted after his heels, you know, every hour of his short faggot life. Um, he ran the school back so there had to be less time for them to call him faggot. You know, faggot McGoldrick, they would shout. Oh, I never called him that, no, no. You know, I, I let the others do it. You know, they, uh, they just chopped him to pieces, you know, every flawless inch of him, you know. Just, uh, just murdered him with giggles and sneers. I, uh, I should have stood up for him and, you know, tried to stop him, but, uh, But I remain silent. Roman playwright Plautus once wrote, Nothing is more wretched than the mind of a man conscious of guilt. While not regarded by many as an exceptionally dominant emotion, guilt has the potential to tear oneself apart. Homeless man Valentina McGoldrick, who barely survives on the streets of Dublin, blames himself for his brother's suppression and eventual suicide. His story serves as a cautionary tale for all those who hold on to deep-seated guilt. Because unchecked, it can lead to dire consequences. Silent, by Pat Kinnebane. Oh, uh, you see, uh, you seen the Stanley knife right here? Uh, you know, there's a, uh, a security guard after me. He nearly caught me robbing it from the hardware shop. You know, he, he's hunting me like I'm a fox. <laughs> Oh, uh, uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, God bless you. God bless you. Oh. oh. Cheers. Uh, an appealing Merlot with uh, sweet berry aromas and, and soft lingering tannins. Oh, absolutely. Oh. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's kind of like me and the ex-spouse, and you know, drunk on duty I was. Uh, if only I could have known how much of a cold soul she had. You know, she used to remind me of all the useless attempts that Pierce had tried in his last eight months of life. And he was completely terrified, you know. He, he was ducking and diving and, and crawling all around. His skin was just riddled with these rashes from stress. All he wanted was to be wanted like the rest of us, right? But it was his own attempts at life. Oh, uh, Alison Moyer was, was playing the jazz festival one night and, and Pierce had a ticket and went to the opera house alone. Well, that's all we knew. Past midnight, there's no sign of Pierce. And there's a shocking wind outside and, and ma'am is very worried. Well, past one o'clock, still no sign of Pierce, but Two in the morning, while well, the cops call to the door, and, and the guard says, um, um, Miss Mack, we found him on McCurtain Street. And you know, McCurtain Street, that's an awful dump of a street to die on him. Um, oh, oh no, Miss Mack, um, he's not dead at all, but he's hanging by his ankles outside the Metropolis Hotel. He, he jumped and took flight, and he, he got his boots hanging on some phone wires on the way down. He's being blown all over by the gossip tonight. And then, you know, Mam visited him the next morning in the infirmary, and she gave Pierce just an, an almighty clatter across the back of his head about 20 or 30 times. And, you know, three nurses had to holler off him, but, but she battered him too, and, and then she, she knocks into Pierce's nose, and then he's just out on the floor. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you, ma'am. God bless you. God bless you.
Oh, no, uh, this is me small man. Oh. You know, uh, he'll be 18 next month. I, uh, I haven't laid eyes on him since he was three. Because, uh, you know, all along, um, he was the one that, you know, uh, kept me sane and, you know, kept me focused and, and running and, you know, uh, not thinking about peers. But, um, you know, near his second birthday, I, I started drinking, you know, like at home. Uh, it wasn't much at first. It was, you know, uh, maybe a point or two at lunchtime. But it, it got screwed up. It just, it just crept up on me. And when, uh, when Judy kicked me out, well, I lost my son as well. And you know, I, I knew, I knew that that was the start of when I began to, you know, lose my mind. And then when things got really chronic, well, Aunt Rita had to commit me. And you know, I, I hated the hospital. It was just two years and surrounded by nut jobs 24-7. And then when they, when they first let me out, well, uh, I literally had nowhere to go. But I knew, I knew I had to get away from core. I, I had this, this army of project workers. There were these 13-week uh, programs with, with dual diagnosis and, and group therapy. You know, they were just these battalions of key workers. And, and let me tell you, I have tried. You know, I have tried and I've tried and I've tried to get myself sorted. But, you know, it's just the damn guilt that won't leave me. Because, because, because I know you know, I know I should have stood up for him more. I, I just know it's just, it's just a trick of my mind, you see. It's just a trick of my mind, you know. I think about Pierce constantly, and, you know, I, I think about my small man. It, it, it's just guilt, you know. It's just guilt roaring and racing in my mind all day. And there's just these, these thoughts that torment me. Because when I think about Pierce, it, it just cripples me like I'm a veteran and, you know, I, I can't get better. I can't, I can't pull myself together. Oh, and, you know, that's just a complete head wreck of head wrecks when, when people have told me, you know, over and over to just pull yourself together. And, you know, I, oh, I can't get better. I can't cope. I can't pull myself together. And I, I just sit here. You know, I can't think. I can't work. I can't, I can't write. I can't see here. You know, I just, I just can't get away from the loudspeaker of mine, you know, because it's just screaming, you know, hey, hey, Valentino McGoldrick, you know what? You're the number one langer. You're, you're the coward. You're, you're just the destroyer of lives. You know, you're just the shit husband. You're the shit father. You're the shit brother. You know, you're just the useless, hopeless, homeless loser. No. No wonder the rugby lads pissed all over me the other night. You know, they they just they just laughed and they they pissed all over me and me blanket and I I couldn't do anything. I just I just pretended I was asleep. I knew, you know, I knew that in my heart, you know, I knew I was in the way. Thank you, sir. God bless. So, uh, five days ago, I, I said to myself, you know, Valentina McGoldrick, you're, you're just full of odd talk. So I, I put on my jacket, and I, uh, I, I went to the hardware shop, and I, um, I got the Stanley knife, and, 
Then, then, then I told myself, you know, go take an evening stroll to the Garden of Remembrance where the Patriots are commemorated. And then I'd, uh, I'd get to the statue of the Children of the Lair, look up at their divine necks, and I'd... Uh, Run the Stanley knife from here to here. And then, you know, they they take me back to Cork in a hearse. You know, they just be you know, bawling all over me as as I'd be shoveled under. Beside Pierce. And you know, I would be near him all the time. And then everything would just finally be glorious. And silence. 